Okay, good morning. Welcome again to Saturday Matters. Um, and we have, uh, as usual, a really fascinating program for you. Before we... um, This one is a Doughboy's Letters from World War I. It's Charlie Puckhammer's father. And we also have Hal Piper, discerning editor and wordsmith, who took some really fabulous, a real treasure um, of Charlie's legacy of letters from his father and put them into a wonderful narrative here. Not exactly narrative, but some extremely well-written and descriptive mm -hmm. reports right from the Western Front. Um, and I have some illustrations that just might, you know, help set the mood. So if we've all got our phones turned off and we're ready to listen and our uh, special house videographer is set up and ready, let's begin. Most of us have never participated in a war, but many of us have family members who did participate. And what a difference in their experiences uh, and the experiences of those of us on the home front. So today we're presenting one man's experience in World War I with a reflection on how he was changed and how his experience affected his progeny. Charlie, will you introduce us to your father? Uh, excuse me. Uh, before uh, Hal uh, uh, reads my father's remembrances uh, uh, from his World War I days, I would like to offer a brief description of what made my father a most unusual American soldier. When Hal is finished, I would like to say a little about how I think this World War I experience played a role in his subsequent life also my some thoughts about its influence on my life. Then I trust there will be some time for your comments and questions and how it suggests. Well, okay, anyway, so I, I think that part of the real value of this session this morning will be that we do contemplate how so a soldier's experience affect not only their life, but the lives <coughs> of their loved ones. And uh, how it, in effect, as we hear about it, our lives, of, our lives now, today. Uh, Ernst Wilford Putkammer was born in January of 1891. He was the only <coughs> child of his father, a German immigrant in 1883, and his mother of first generation American uh, heritage uh, woman from Iowa. The three lived in Chicago his father being a successful uh, retail and wholesale coal merchant. Will, that's my father's name, it's my parents long enough, was most a most unusual youth. He never went to school, but was tutored until he, he had one year in a small private school before attending Princeton, from which he graduated in 1914. In most of his youth years, the three traveled to Europe, visiting a Berlin uncle's family, as well as historical and cultural uh, sites uh, in the, uh, on the continent. No doubt these trips 
facilitated were for, for, was were facilitated by his fluency in English and in French, excuse me, which he had added to the German and English, which he was practically born with. <coughs> Unfortunately, that language fluency was not passed on to this fellow here. <laughs> At Princeton, my father was a uh, academic star, a junior 5'8", but not an athlete. To illustrate that, he, he did shoot in his 80s in golf, but that was for nine holes. <laughs> uh, one of his classmates, however, at Princeton was Hobie Baker. Are you ice, ice hockey fans who know who Hobie Baker was? Um, uh, upon graduating, my father was went immediately to the University of Chicago Law School where he again was at the top of his class. In this several months after his graduation in 1917, uh, he uh, worked uh, while awaiting his entrance into the uh, military. He worked in the Washington office where, uh, where his German uh, was useful in, uh, in an office which followed the German businesses in the United States which uh, the government was concerned were, were subverting uh, activity, doing subversive activities in the United States. But in the spring of 1918, he became 27 year old uh, private in the U.S. Army. <coughs> private, front camera. Yeah. Okay. Letters from the AEF. Dear family, the camp meet days, training, that's training camp, camp meet days seem to be getting near their end. The men who have been here for months are even more excited about it than I am. And at that, our three or four weeks have given me enough of it. Overseas uniforms were issued yesterday. The woolly kind, they call olive drab, OD for short, instead of the smooth khaki. Oh, there, we there we go. go. <laughs> They're letting us keep the big felt hats. But they say in France the troops wear little caps over the right eye like a bunch of bellboys. But they took our canvas leggings and gave us spiral puttees, long ribbons of cloth that you wind around your legs and tuck in to make them stay up. Outside the clothing, everything seems so purposeless and unplanned. For example, they've suddenly developed a great fear of there being too much work left in the time ahead, so they get us up at 5.15 in the morning. <laughs> and then we sit around all day waiting for something to turn up. I haven't spent one minute at work since I got up today. Then by evening, somebody finally thinks of something, we have to go to it like nailers until way into the night. Next day, same thing. Well, we'll soon be off. The rumor is we're going to England. The fact is, nobody who talks knows, and nobody who knows talks. <laughs> Keep writing to me here, as mail will be forwarded if we are gone. <clears throat> Dear family, a week of waiting, but we are still here. Yesterday, we were marched down to the railroad yard in formation that we will use boarding the train. I should be the fifth man aboard in our battalion of over 700. The next letter is dated some days later and was written on board the transport ship. There can't have been much secrecy about the division sailing. 
this terrific crowds were out in every town and village that the train rushed through on the way to New York. And just as thick at midnight, 1 a.m., 2, 3, 4 a.m., every time we stopped screaming, laughing, crying people by the thousands squeezed against our cars all night long. The trip was a nightmare with those endless hysterical faces flashing out of the dark and into it again. It was morning when we got to Jersey City. You can imagine our thrill when we saw, on the other side of the pier, the transport Leviathan. That is the new name, you know, of the Vaterland, the biggest steamer in the world. The Red Cross gave us a roll and a cup of coffee apiece, and then we began to pour in by about a dozen gangways, single file. Each one as he went aboard was given a little square pasteboard card specifying hatchway, deck, berth, and latrine numbers with a few directions, mainly on what to do if the ship sank. <laughs> then down, down, down on the narrow steel staircase, farther and farther from daylight, and the directions of what to do if the ship sank seeming more and more fantastic, as one deck after another rose up above us. We only stopped when we reached H deck, the eighth one, far below the waterline, the very lowest, with only steel and canvas in sight. Of course, the daylight never gets down that far, and at first it gave one a trapped feeling, as if buried alive with no chance to ever get out again. That was horrible, but it soon wore off. The entire ship is divided into sections separated by watertight doors that are never opened, except on special orders. To get from one section to another, even its next neighbor, means a long vertical journey, but darn little horizontal progress. Inside a section, all the partition walls have been knocked out, making each deck a huge compartment filled with hundreds of upright pipes to which four corner, the four corners of the bunks are fastened. The bunks are in tiers of three, the lowest barely off the steel floor, the highest right near the steel ceiling, and they're very simple, nothing more than a single tightly stretched sheet of canvas. These tiers are end-to-end -end and two abreast with a 16-inch corridor separating each group. That gives very little space for one's belongings. No room for them in the corridor, so it takes them to bed with oneself. And as the bunk is only 20 inches wide, that is its drawbacks to me. It is very easy to get lost, as all the corridors and bunks look alike, and all are filled with about the same mixture of personal belongings. Homeless wanderers are continually searching about. <laughs> the latrine facilities are very simple, but are kept clean. There are nothing more than two boards at least 20 feet long and about six inches apart. A powerful stream of water constantly flows along below this gap. The arrangements for washing are very poor. The water is salt, and no chance to get or buy salt water soap was given us, so a lather is out of the question. This complicates shaving. Some shave dry, many smuggle a little coffee back from mealtime and use that. I have a collapsible drinking cup, and when the sentry at the freshwater butt isn't looking, I palm it and fill the bottom section. I can get just enough to get the brush thoroughly wet. I get very little chance to learn what the weather is like, as we have 22 hours below and only two hours on deck in each 24. On that basis, every outfit gets its equal share of daylight. Even so, the deck is very crowded, no room to walk about and only to stand. One day we were sent up in bunches of a hundred or so at a time, minus all clothing, and the gobs, sailors, played great streams of salt water over us. It was great fun for the Red Cross nurses looking down at us from what used to be the first class deck. Well, I enjoyed it as much as they did. And all of us howling like wild Indians as the water hit us like a club. Now, to get to a subject you have probably all been thinking of, submarines. I have thought a lot about them and was pretty scared at first, particularly while we were still in New York Harbor. I've been dulling off since then. Not that we don't think of it. We all do, all the time. Can't help it. I don't refer to the daily abandoned ship drill or to the absolute darkness outdoors after sundown. These things occur only once a day. But the constant reminders, such as never for an instant leaving our life jackets off, sleeping even with a canteen of fresh water fastened to one's belt, never letting oneself get thirsty, and so on. It seems so strange to think that at any instant, this pleasant ship 
may begin sinking, perhaps even before I get through writing this sentence. It seems so odd that out there in that perfectly normal looking water, there may be any number of little metal shells filled with men anxious above everything else in the world to kill us. Now, as we come into the danger zone, they get us up and awake before dawn, ready for the order to abandon ship. This is because the early twilight is the most dangerous time. We are already invisible, but an approaching torpedo would not be. As many units as possible are kept on deck all night. They are in luck, as it is terribly hot to sleep way below with all one's clothes on, even shoes. As for mess, we are taken there on the run, gulp our food, and run back again. Now we have the arrival at Brest, France. I have never in my life had so happy a sight as that of the lighthouse at the entrance to the longish roadstead leading to the French harbor where we are to land. Nor any so beautiful as the French fields and farms as we moved in. Absolutely safe now from the little metal shells filled with men out there in the ocean. It was afternoon when we anchored. I volunteered for the baggage detail to land and help take care of it. Oh, not on selfishness on my part. I am too much of a soldier for that. Just an appraisal of working on the baggage and a probable ride on an auto truck on one hand and marching with your pack on the other. If there was much marching to be done, I won. If little, I lost. As it turned out, I won heavily. It must have been nine o'clock at least before we of the baggage detail were landed. It's pitch dark, inky dark, whichever is the darker. No lights at all. The perennial fog had turned into a heavy drizzle. As our little tender duct, a guide met us, told us to follow him in Indian file, each one holding the man in front of him, and set off. How he knew where he was going, I've never figured out. Maybe he didn't know. Anyway, we groped along for about five minutes and covered a few hundred feet, rain dripping from our faces down our necks, and our feet gripped by the mud for which this seaport is getting famous. Suddenly our guide remarked, all right, here you are. It was undeniably true, as we certainly were there. But where was that? As information goes, it was near complete zero. Several days later, four or five, I think, a lot has happened. We have moved from somewhere in France to somewhere else in France. We got orders to load our baggage on coal cars, then we spread big tarpaulins over each car. Just as we were finishing, our company came marching in, and we were all sent into freight cars. Forty men to the car and started off. I'll never forget that trip. It was worth coming to France for. But don't imagine you can guess how far it was by figuring the time we were on the way. Length of time and distance covered sometimes have any connection with each other. Not that our way of traveling was overly luxurious. Forty men in one little car are a tight fit. And when our heads were near the floor, we could tell beyond a doubt that it had very lately served as a pullman for cattle. <laughs> but during the daytime it was fine. I sat in the open doorway watching the scenery crawl by. We moved awfully slowly, but that was all right, as at every village the natives would pile out to greet us. From the way they behaved, we must be among the first Americans they've seen. Look at Blase later, I think. A funny thing happened in one little town, where we made one of our stops of vague duration. A Frenchman in a Breton smock sidled up, whispering, Cognac! Cognac! You know, we are not allowed to buy it, so that has stimulated demand for it. And one of our men, a hard sort of fellow, immediately began his, Combien, combien, combien. Negotiations kept going on for a long time as they both seemed to want to drag them out. I could get the American's reason for that. He did not want to make a purchase while the train was still standing, and an officer might come up and confiscate the purchase. The Frenchman was more of a puzzle. But sure enough, just as the train slowly started up again, the deal was closed. Though how they could understand each other was more than I could discover. The American, with a look of contentment, retired to a far corner and went to work. A moment later, a volley of curses and yells of fury. That goddamn blankety black frog, he sold me a bottle of cold tea. <laughs> I laughed and laughed. And finally asked him how much he paid for the tea. Paid him? Paid him? Hell, I gave the son of a bitch a bunch of cigar store coupons. <laughs> now, about attending to the calls of nature, as it is very definitely a part of AE life, I think I'll take a chance and describe 
one aspect of the situation. Whenever the train stops, those so inclined pour forth from it and retire a distance of some five to ten feet from the track, according to the extent of their modesty. Now, the Army uniform has one disadvantage. It is not quickly adjusted to a squatting posture, and no one ever knows how long the train will stop. It may be for an hour or two, or maybe for scarcely more than a few seconds. If the latter is the case, as all of those remaining on board devoutly hope, a situation arises that is extremely disconcerting to the actors. There is even considerable joyous betting between neighboring cars as to the relative speed with which their rep relative respective representatives will conclude matters and dash in pursuit of moving train. The long train starts so slowly that no one ever fails to catch up. And it certainly helps to pass the time. From another letter. Another piece of good news. I have been made company interpreter and transferred to the headquarters section. That section has no machine gun and no mule, and I'll not have to take my turn at being valet to one of those creatures. Now I know that an education is worth having. It's good fun going about acting as go-between for the officers. And when they don't need me, the men do, so I'm very busy. Yesterday I was away from the company all day. Our supply sergeant needed a miscellaneous lot of things, all the way from king bolts to needles and thread. So I was sent off to a small town some miles away to get them. It was great, it was great to step into shops again, walk on sidewalks, and all that sort of thing. I was also a financier as I cashed several hundred dollars worth of checks for the boys. Then wandered off into the country, sat down, and spent the day reading. Came back late and got an extra good meal because I'd had such a long, hard day of it, and they appreciated it. <laughs> Today we took a bath in the Seine. How many Americans have bathed in the Seine? We're given a couple of hours extra to launder our underwear. I made a very successful experiment in laundering. I put the underwear on and lathered away with most gratifying results. The supply sergeant and I have established a sort of bourse here. We barter army soap and candles against milk and eggs. As we are one and they are many, the trading offers are lively on their side, and a lively Frenchman is a uh, well, a lively Frenchman. Mm -hmm. Three or four days later. Well, it was too good to last. Rumors have begun to circulate that we might have to move soon. At nine in the evening, we were ordered to report to quarters and start packing company baggage at once. It was all done by 11, a very late hour for the Army. At 3 a.m., we were up again, had a hasty breakfast, piled into a long line of trucks, and rumbled off. It was 2.30 in the afternoon before we got to where we were going, a village named Oxe in Burgundy. And a trip that long in a crowded truck with only one sandwich, pretty well, Tigers won out. The new village is very much a place for the worse. No little town nearby, no places to ramble to. Yesterday our gas masks were tested. They were issued 10 days or so ago, and ever since then we have drilled, wearing them longer and longer times. They're extremely unpleasant to have on. The heat fogs the eyepieces at once. The clips that pinch the nostrils get shut like pincers after a while, and you constantly have to hold a big rubber mouthpiece in your mouth and breathe through it. This causes a very free flow of saliva, which there is no chance of swallowing a most uncomfortable and messy state of affairs. The mask test that got me on this subject was taken in a little airtight shack. We entered it in small groups, and then the gas was turned on. The purpose partly was to get us a little used to the idea of being in a situation where it would have been our finish to remove the mask. It didn't affect any of us, and there was no apparent difference in anything, except that when we came out, our clothes had a funny, sharp odor a week or so later. Well, family, the Army is beginning to appreciate my worth as I got my first promotion. I am no longer a private. I am now a private first class. <laughs> Not that that rank is so high as to raise one above sordid details. In fact, by a queer irony, I go on kitchen police the very next day. But they pick the non-coms, sergeants, uh, from first class privates, usually. And meanwhile, we get paid $3 a month more. With the other $3 bonus for overseas service, I am now drawing down $36 a month. 
can buy a lot of hazelnuts for that, and there's nothing else on which to spend one's money. The first week it cost me, uh, I take that back, you can hire a local you can hire a local resident to do your laundry. The first week it cost me one franc sixty or eight cents. So I changed and found a cheaper one who did it for sixty centimes or three cents. For that price, mending and darning are of course included. She is just simply swamped with customers, but I shall be taken care of as I do her interpreting for her. <coughs> I went on a potato buying expedition with the mess sergeant. The picket sergeant lets us have a horse on an official trip like that. So we hitched up a car and drove off to a bigger village, maybe 1,000 inhabitants, some three or four miles off. All large dealings like ours, we buy a couple hundred pounds at a time, are handled directly with the mayor. It was an amusing experience dealing with him. He's a big stout man, and your first glance would tell you he is the mayor and kingpin here. All during our talk, people kept coming in with documents to be certified or little disputes to be adjusted. Of course, our dealing was, as per custom, very leisurely, at a dining room table and with plenty of wine to aid negotiations. And they needed aid, as everything was entirely on a barter basis, and called for weighing the desirability of his potatoes by the kilo against the varying merits of our grease for the can, soap by the pound, candles by the piece, etc. And as everything had to go through the interpreter, you can guess that the deal took a long time. In fact, Sergeant Gregory got very mellow from the wine and couldn't understand why the mayor didn't warm up to his increasingly generous offers. <coughs> That's easy enough. I simply didn't translate the generous parts. <laughs> On the whole, I think we made a good bargain, and certainly the mayor saw to it that he didn't come out of the short end. The drive home was very pleasant and peaceful, except that the sergeant got a little obstreperous at times. And the minute we got back, I had to catch up on accumulated errands on my steady job as interpreter. The captain needed a new laundry woman. Somebody had to have rosin right away. What on earth anyone can want rosin for is more than I can figure out. The supply wagon had broken a king bolt again, and the blacksmith must make a new one right away. A horse had died, and should we bury it as it was, or did anyone want to buy the hide? And so on, day after day. No school ever had things like that in its French courses. <laughs> Besides machine gun drill, we've been learning how to throw hand grenades. Not so simple as it sounds, as you must get them away at the same time that the firing pin is released. And was just as much to the point, get yourself away too. <laughs> the railroad embankment made a dandy place, as we could hide in shelter on one side and heave them across the tracks and, tracks and down on the other side. It went very well, and we were really having a fine time hearing them bang and watching things fly up in the air, till the inevitable sour note appeared, in the shape of a perfectly furious Frenchman, who didn't in the least care that we were learning how to save his country but instead was tremendously enraged because we'd shot down all the telegraph wires along the railroad. We slunk off ignominiously. It is most embarrassing when keyed to a high pitch of martial enthusiasm to be told to go and play in some other backyard. Three days later, A Company and the Machine Gun Battalion are things of the past, and I'm in a new world entirely. I am to be an observer, a divisional observer. Sounds very exciting, but I don't know what it really all means as yet. After some days, like a clap of thunder, orders came. The division was moving. Back to our billets in terrible excitement. All night long through the pouring rain, tremendous motor trucks rolled past ceaselessly, some with soldiers, some with machine guns, some with ammunition, but most with great masses of mysterious looking boxes and bales whose contents I have any idea of. We sat up all night until gradually the darkness turned to gray and so back to day, and the line of trucks thinned out and finally ended. Then began an interminable morning waiting and waiting for something, anything, to happen. Everything was quiet, the world was gone, all but us. By insensible degrees the morning shifted over to the afternoon and the afternoon into twilight and evening and darkness again. So we settled down for another night of it, when all of a sudden the order came to fall in. We lined up in the village street with our packs and full equipment in pelting rain, and swung off down the road to the railroad. It was to take us on the first stage toward the front. 
Our division, as a green organization, was assigned the quiet sector in which to get our bearings. I was one of a small group known as Divisional, Over Divisional Observers, about a dozen of us all told, whose rather independent assignment was to arrange all of the divisional front wherever we chose, wherever, in other words, we felt we could best perform our job of observing enemy movements and activity of all sorts. This might have been a hilltop, a ruined house, most often a bare tree, but always one of the second best places. The best would unerringly be so marked on the German maps and regularly treated to heavy doses of fire. It was just about dawn when we entered the woods in which the observation post was situated, quite the finest observation post we ever saw all through the war. It was high up in an enormous beech tree and had a winding stairway leading to it. The little platform was enclosed on all sides so that a night uh, so that a light could be struck in it at night. There was a place for our tripod, a desk, and two telephones, one to division headquarters, the other to the foot of the tree. A little sheet iron house was our living quarters and housed the other end of the telephone. It was positively palatial, and rumor had it that it was one of those perfectly safe spots from which the great men of Europe, the class who made the war, were permitted to catch a glimpse of their handiwork. A nice, safe glimpse, far from the unpleasant details of human suffering. Perhaps the rumor was true. At any rate, the Major General commanding our division visited it while I was on duty once. From our post, the points of interest spread out like a panorama. Away to the right was the valley of the Meuse River, and the heights that held the ring of forts that we collectively called Verdun. Nearer were villages, ruined farms, hills that carried names unknown to me then. <coughs> Dominating all the German position was a sharply sloping hill with a village crowning its very summit. Hill and village, bearing a name that came to mean much to me. A name so prominent that even American newspapers mentioned it once or twice. This was Montfaucon, where the German crown prince had his headquarters. One large house at the very peak of the hill stood out, tall and commanding. I little dreamt how dramatically I was to learn why it was so sound and strong. We divided the day into four-hour shifts and began watching. It doesn't sound hard to sit in a warm treetop for four hours and watch what may be going on. But actually, the next few weeks meant as hard work as I had ever had to do in all my life. There were only three of us. Food and water had to be carried from the dugouts of an infantry organization a mile away. It had to be prepared and cooked. All the routines of camping out must be attended to. And all the time, one of us was up in that treetop day and night. 12 to 4 is not so bad in the afternoon. It is a terrible strain on a weary body and taut nerves from midnight to 4 in the morning. It was then that homesickness and fear descended on us, blacker than even the outside night. That, at least, had brilliant, very light star shells and chenilles lighting it up from afar. Sometimes the calm was broken by excitement that was even worse. Once a veritable inferno of noise broke out on a single core billet in a little village nearby, screaming, banging on pots and pans, anything to make a noise. Breathless, I wondered what it was. It could not be a German attack. We were too far from the lines. It all had been normal out there. How inexperienced I was. A few weeks later, I would instantly have recognized the dull, thudding explosion of those shells that had rattled so harmlessly on the signal men's dugouts as gas shells. One learns fast when the punishment is death. And there is no truer passage in all that great book, All Quiet on the Western Front, than the one where the veteran pities the poor little recruit who did not know how to save himself. No training camp, only experience, will teach the different sounds of the explosions of shells, <coughs> shrapnel, high explosive, and the terrific but also comforting crash of one's own cannon shell, cannon, sending shells away from one. As a matter of fact, though gas trouble us but little, gas is heavier than air, and to direct it at a hilltop would have been a harmless folly that the economical Germans could be counted on not to commit. One night I was on watch in our tree for what turned out to be the last time. Everything was quiet when with one sudden crash, pandemonium broke loose. It was the barrage preparatory to the American attack, the final uh, advance. We stayed where we were, as no comparable observation post could be established in the lower ground before us, 
But by afternoon, we decided to follow the advancing American troops. We packed our observation equipment and a few most precious personal belongings on our backs and set out. We soon reached what had been for four years, and until that morning, been no man's land. Such desolation as that cannot be adequately put into words. There was literally nothing but giant craters, one merely obliterating and replacing its predecessors. Not even ruins of villages were left, or torn trees. Not a sign of life, but even so much as a blade of grass. Our infantry had struggled through and across this region, several miles wide right here, just a little before, and was now digging in somewhere on the other side. We passed them in our own slow progress, down into a crater and scrambling up on the other side, and down into the next crater and up again, over and over. There were no dead or wounded to be seen, which was natural, as the Germans, of course, had not been out here. And the Americans had silenced all opposition until we got to the other side. A little more, and we were in the front lines, in a small open woods, the infantry no longer advancing, holding their ground, peering ahead for the invisible enemy who might be anywhere, far away or just out of sight, or even silently filtering in behind us. Every one of us tense and clammy with fear, we sought out and hunted up the most promising observation posts and did what we could to report events. The men not on watch, asking as relays, and how little we knew that we could report. Shifting as the infantry seemed to shift, forward and backward, it was a nightmare of constant strain and no rest. How long it lasted, I do not know even now. Days immersed in the nights and back again. It seemed endless, but I suppose it was comparatively brief. One of it. One event though stands out of my memory, clear as yesterday. I was just then the relay farthest back and carried our meager little reports direct to division headquarters, which by then had also crossed the one time no man's land. I had just delivered such a report when a staff officer came out and told me that the commanding general was wholly uncertain whether the Germans did or did not still hold Montfaucon, that high pinnacle I put my telescope on so often. Aviation brought no news. Infantry reports were utterly confusing. <coughs> the divisional youth observers were utterly useless, skulking in the woods with the infantry and reporting nothing. I and the first other observer I could find were to get, uh, to get, uh, I could get hold of were, were to find out, and to find out right away and definitely. I was so frightened that I was speechless. I knew there was nothing to say. I rounded up another man and we set out. We were soon out of the woods, in whose protection our troops then were, and moving out in the open toward what was left of some stone buildings that had changed possessors several times already. Just now, no American troops were that far advanced, but we knew that the Germans, too, had given up the effort to hold it, so it was the first shelter for which to make. <coughs> Straight beyond it, with little or no shelter of any sort, and only a mile away, lay Montfaucon itself at the end of a long, upward slope of roads and fields. We moved forward inch by inch, hoping that our uniforms would conceal us if there were any eyes up there, and motionless as a stone if any airplane droned overhead, not daring to show the white spots of our faces by looking up to see if it was allied or German. On and on we went, and still no bullets singing by us. Surely they'd have seen us by now if there were any left up there. We seemed all alone in the world. No one ahead, no one behind us, or on either side. The first houses, or what was left of them, were only a few hundred feet away, then only a hundred. Another minute, we were cautiously creeping in among them. Everything was still. We sat down to hold a council of war. Near us, a clear, cool spring. And never did water taste so good as we drank and drank. The excitement, I suppose, had parched our throats. The fact that there were no Germans on this side of town established almost conclusively that there were none on the other side either, as they would try, hardly try to hold it and yet allow a foothold to be got on this side. Still, it might be a trap. We had better go on and see. So we skulked forward for all the world like small boys playing Indian, growing somewhat less scared at every step and everything so quiet. Not even an occasional shell explosion at first probably because neither artillery felt sure of its own lines. A little, a little way ahead, though, perhaps a quarter of a mile, there were bangs now and then. Somebody was keeping up a mild and perfunctory bombardment on something. 
we wondered what it was, and then rounding a turn, found out. There, right before us, stood the Crown Prince's headquarters. Tall, massive, solid. The same building I had so often looked at through my telescope. We decided that we'd better have a look around and inside it. The occasional shells appeared to be German ones, which was reassuring as it indicated that there were probably no enemy troops around. They were fairly regular and so could be timed rather accurately. My partner went around in one direction and I in the other. Adjoining the house was an ocean. It was an orchard. Adjoining the house was an orchard. The trees still in pretty good condition. I made for it and ducked behind a wall and under a tree, waiting for the next shell, which was nearly due. In a moment it came, exploding with a terrific crash almost straight above me, but perfectly harmlessly. Next moment I nearly dropped dead with fright. There was a heavy clap on my shoulder. How I ever managed to turn around, I don't know. The shell had neatly shot one of the branches off the apple tree, and falling it had struck across my shoulder. In a few minutes, we'd worked quite round the house and found nobody. We cautiously peeked into the door. A room in wild disorder, partially destroyed papers everywhere, as if the accumulation of many months had hastily been examined and partly removed. Overturned furniture, a half-eaten meal on the table. And on the floor, a little white rabbit munching a head of cabbage. <laughs> Probably the occupants had been afraid of gas and kept him because of his sensitivity to atmospheric changes. That finished our errand, and we returned with more confidence than we had in coming, thinking it was the last of grim old Mofacon for us. As a matter of fact, a few days later, saw our troops once again advancing, and we concluded that the best observation post for us would be the high, solid old chateau. So back we went, this time with far less fear and trembling. I stopped again at the spring where I'd had that fine, cool drink. I was about to fill my canteen when a military police hurried up and ordered me away. Don't you know, you damn dough boy, that the Germans poisoned this spring? In vain to argue, he knew better, and so another atrocity story was born and grew fat. Not that there weren't atrocities. Plenty of them, as many no doubt on one side as on the other. If we Americans were a whit better than Germans or French, or for all I know English, it was simply that the war had not yet had time to plunge us into the real depths of bestiality. But we would learn fast, give us another six months, and our virtuous indignation would have been as hypocritical as that of all the others. <laughs> I know how rapidly my own coarseness, yes, bestiality, was rising. I had proof of it at the very time of which I am now writing. We had established our observation post in the chateau. Our troops, instead of being behind us, had once more swept forward, had encircled Montfaucon, and were now a little ways beyond it. The German artillery was concentrating on the road, leading through the village and past our house, making it very hard to bring up supplies. We had to make use of our emergency rations. I was eating some hardtack. When a slightly wounded man came in, he had lost all of his and asked me to give him a little. I did, and he started off down the road. He'd gone perhaps 100 feet when there was a terrific crash of high explosive. A fragment killed him instantly. I walked over, saw that the heart attack in his hand was untouched and free from blood. No use to him anymore. I stooped it down, pulled it away, and walked back again. Is there anything to be proud of here? I was, and I am, I think, as tender-hearted and sympathetic toward human suffering as the average person. Yet only a few days have been enough to work this change. Maudlin sentimentalists dare to speak of the soldier's noble sacrifice. Sweet it is to die for one's country. Noble, sweet. There is not a movement or an impulse that is not bestial and cruel when two armies of fear-crazed men seek to kill each other. Nobility and chivalry. Do you know what it is that epitomizes war? It is the bayonet drill's instruction, how to kick your opponent in the testicles. That is its nobility. Our division had carried all of its share of the heavy fighting for some time. It was badly used up. We were to be relieved, moved to the rear, have our ranks refilled. What blessed news that was. The observers of the incoming state and division arrived. We hastily gave them the lay of the land and ran the gantlet of swell-shell-swept road, swell -shell -swept road toward the rear. We marched nearly all night and then reached division headquarters and the next day we moved many miles by auto trucks to our rest area. 
Those days could not have been as perfect as they seemed, but no matter. There's one exploit I remember that cost us observers unalloyed joy, although to tell the truth, it began with unalloyed larceny. We eagerly wanted a huge tin of lard possessed by headquarters mess, but how to get it? Supplies were always closely guarded. We watched and watched till one night luck came our way. Only one cook was on hand. All of us but one made a noisy raid on the wood pile. He rushed out to save his breakfast fuel. The decoys ran away, and the lone soldier did the rest, and we had the lard. <laughs> With a generous share of the lard we purchased from a French peasant, we were back among civilians again. A fat hen, still on the hoof, some potatoes, some lettuce. In return for the rest of the lard, she prepared the meal. Chicken fricassee, fried potatoes, salad, bread, and van ordinaire. <laughs> Feast for the gods, off dishes that we would not have to wash. We roistered and guzzled gaily. <clears throat> but this idyllic existence lasted only a few days, less, I think, than a week. Then we, a veteran division now, were sent up to the Sami Hill Front. Our headquarters were in an old German rest area and were very comfortable. Nearby lay an obscure village with a famous past, Mar Latour. I gazed at it curiously. It was there that a great battle had been fought between French and Germans in 1870 almost exactly 48 years ago. It was mainly a cavalry action, and the German cavalry commander that day was a Prussian Junker officer, Otto von Puttkammer. And then I remembered when I was a very small boy and my parents took me up into northern Germany for a visit to the sweeping estates of my great uncle Otto, who had once been a cavalry officer and was still very direct and military. It seemed a queer world. So then the acts and scenes succeeded each other until that final one in November 1918. We'd had a perfectly nerve-straining time of nearly two weeks, trying to maintain some semblance of observation under very difficult conditions, as fire was constant and heavy. Morale was pulled down still farther by an almost complete lack of sleep, and by the difficulty and danger in getting our food supplies, and the worst thing was the limit on our water allowance, about a pint a day. It was hard and very hard to face danger with the end of the war so plainly approaching. At last the firing grew lighter and lighter as the rumors flew thick and fast. We ourselves heard the definite news in the end at about 10 a.m. on November 11th. <clears throat> Three quarters of an hour later the last gun boomed and there was quiet. A strange, unnatural quiet. It was unreal. There were no demonstrations of joy. The coming of the end had been too plain for that and our feelings of relief and thankfulness to be alive, and that it was all over, were, I think, too deep for demonstrating. If there had been any such impulse, it would have stopped the bash before one spot of unutterable grimness and sadness, a long, silent row of blanket-covered blanket forms waiting for the graves to be completed. In the afternoon, we moved up into new positions taken over from the Germans, anti-fraternization orders had not yet come to us. And there was a feeling of indescribable weirdness in showing oneself plainly to them, seeing them just as plainly, even going over freely and unconcernedly to talk to them. That, more than anything else, carried realization of what had actually happened. In the evening after dark began the most beautiful display of fireworks that any human being has ever seen. The, humans were, the, Germans, the Germans were celebrating by burning up all their flares, very lights, rockets, star shells, chenilles, and anything that would illuminate the heavens from one horizon to the other. As far as the eye could reach, an almost solid Milky Way flashed and sparkled in the sky. We stood in awe and gazed at the spectacle as it went on hour after hour and hour after hour until it too dimmed in the dawn of a new and brighter day. Hmm. Charlie, your turn. As I indicated in my introduction, um, I'd like to mention some things that affected my father after the war. Uh, he and my 
grandparents continued to travel to Europe after the war. And uh, my father, being the intensely uh, academic and literary uh, man he was, was, I think, very, very aware of what was happening in Europe after the war. And I doubt if there was one American in goodness knows how many that was as aware of what was brewing with the Nazis than he was. And his feelings about what was to come, he could not, of course, predict at the Holocaust, but his feelings about the Nazis could not possibly have been more uh, aware of what a disaster for Germany as well as the whole world and the uh, German Jewish population <coughs> as well as the population of so much of the rest of Europe. I think that was one of the results. I think um, Another effect was is that he, having had the background that he had of being tutored and being the son of a very privileged family, had not had any exposure to more or less ordinary Americans. Well, in the Army he did. He was a private. <laughs> and uh, Hal didn't mention this, but one of the things that he wrote in the paper was is that he was asked by a African-American soldier uh, that he happened to come across as to uh, which way is north. He, I guess it was a brief pause in activity and uh, so uh, my father indicated which way was north and I said, well, why did you ask? He says, oh, I just wanted to look at North America. <laughs> <laughs> and also there was another point in the ship going over to uh, Europe in which he said there was speculation as to whether they were still in the Atlantic or had crossed over into the Pacific. <laughs> anyway, um, and so he was exposed to that kind of uh, different people than he had had. And I think that was very useful for him in his later life. Uh, another uh, thing is, is that, of course, like others, he had um, friendships. Now, I had a little bit of <coughs> awareness of that. He, so I was pretty young and he had me meet a man in Washington DC who was a florist and his florist friend wanted to tell me about some experience that he had had with my father uh, in uh, France I guess and you know I can't really remember what it was but uh, they had clearly been very close buddies. Well, he was a private, father was private, so uh, that was, they were friends then. Uh, John McDonald was a private and he became such a close family friend that years later we had, uh, uh, when I was small, we had Thanksgiving dinner with them every year, I think, in Chicago, uh, and his children, or one of his daughters, and Cardi and I became quite close in, in, recent, year, in recent years. Uh, and one of his friends, and this is after the war, I think, but became uh, Jay Gould's grandson, <coughs> who was a very literate man, and Jay Gould's grandson and my father became lifelong friends. 
Well, that's not really relevant to World War I so much, but anyway. <laughs> now, uh, the um, effect of the war through my father on me, I think I'll try and be brief about this, but my father, as I had indicated briefly, was that he was a non-athletic person for me, as I was a kid, athletes, athletics were everything. I was, uh, loved to play softball or baseball, and I remember being very disappointed when my father, literally in the backyard of our Chicago home, couldn't play catch. <laughs> and as a was always so interested in having me speak proper English and, and, and his reading was not my reading and, and anyway so I wasn't hostile to my father but he was just in a different world in many respects. <coughs> it wasn't as if we were pals except we were both great baseball fans so we did go to the Cubs and White Sox games. And, that was that was super. But anyway, anyway, but after I got to be somewhat of an adult, and and especially since I went to Princeton too, and when I graduated, I became a private in the U.S. Army. <laughs> after I think I was the only Princeton classmate that did become a private instead of taking the officer route that was so easy to do. And I appreciated much more than anybody could have done uh, what my father had gone through in the privations. Now, he did not go through the awful, awful trench warfare of the German and British and French guys in those terrible years from 1914 uh, until 1918. My father did not have that, but nevertheless, he, he knew what it was to be in war. He knew what it was to be facing danger of the first order. And uh, I had enough appreciation of that after I had been in the Army to really appreciate my father in a way that I don't think I had before. So uh, I came to, well, I can't say love, it's a sort of difficult word to deal with, but uh, I, I came to certainly appreciate my father in a way which I had not as a, as a young guy. I think that's an effect of the war, or the war. Uh, his experience uh, sloughing off into me. So I guess that's what, and I, I guess Al, if we could ask for questions and comments. <coughs> just, just one more thing to answer. Kelly's not the only one who was a private in the United States Army. I was too. <laughs> also, I want to thank Karen for the slideshow that she put together. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's up there now? What's up there now are different styles of poppies that the Allies had: uh, Canada, England, Scotland across the top row, New Zealand, USA, and France had the blue in there. But um, that's all from November 11th, and in, in Europe they still, yeah, we celebrate Veterans Day, and it belongs to everybody, and uh, you, know, you, you don't see many poppies, uh, you go shopping, yeah, that's what on Veterans Day. But in London, any of us who've ever been there on a November 11th, uh, it was kind of moved by the fact that 100 years later, it is something that's still very much in the mind of, uh, of the people yeah. there. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. I'll turn it over to questions. Okay, I'm look, I, I think this is the one that doesn't give us feedback, and could someone turn those lights on? 
and thanks so much. This is a really very moving presentation, even though it was more than a century ago. And I see Fred. I saw your hand first. In the late 70s and early 80s, the editor of the University Herald here in the University District uh, was someone who had uh, fought in uh, World War I. He relied on the written word because he had been so gassed by mustard gas that it was very difficult for him to be able to communicate orally. Yeah, that was one of the most terrible weapons. Uh, Eleanor? Well, I lived my growing up years with the effects of World War I. We could never forget them because my father left university and went to fight as a private. He was in the Ardennes. He was gassed with mustard gas and he vomited blood periodically throughout his adult life. And interesting enough, the government gave him a stipend, $170 a month, and that died with him, but he had it all those years. And despite all of that, he had a wonderful productive life and lived to be 75. <laughs> I was wondering about the term doughboy and how that came to be. What, why doughboy? And it carried through World War II also, they're called doughboys. I don't know. <laughs> That's interesting because... I guess the iPhone could tell us. So I'll, look, I'll look for it. Well, I, was, I was curious about that myself, so I looked it up. And there's several, uh, and not really very plausible. So I, I guess the answer is nobody really knows. Supposedly there was a kind of dumpling that the Americans ate, but nobody could identify it, and I couldn't find a picture. Um, so it, it's uh, the origin is lost to us, I guess. Jerry. So, uh, 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 Charlie, uh, when you said your dad had a sort of a view of how things were going to develop in the future. Uh, was it because of uh, he saw something in the German character, or was it the force of reparations that were forced on the Germans? Well, I, I think he had had, because Woodrow Wilson, when he was at Princeton, had been president of Princeton until just before he got to Princeton that he had great, great hopes for the League of Nations and the whole idea that the world would never have another congregation like World War One. And when he got to Europe after World War One, and he saw the disaster of the inflation and, and all and, and how uh, Germany is father's nation had suffered as it did and the consequence of that included that bastard uh, Hitler uh, and, and the Nazis gaining strength I, I, I think that he, he just was very very conscious of uh, what fascism was doing uh, long, well before January of 1933 when the Nazis took over the government. And, and you know, he, he became, not that he wasn't a patriot, of course, before that, but his feelings about America and America's need to be uh, the force that supported England when England was in such desperate trouble. I, I think that that was probably extra, extra strong. I mean, the, the isolationists, the Charles Lindbergh America First movement, I, I think probably was such a total anathema to him. 
Yeah. And that would have been uh, an aftermath of uh, his knowledge of what led to uh, or followed after World War One. Yeah, uh, as you spoke, I couldn't help but think of another war, another private. My brother was uh, in France fighting and uh, on the front lines within days of arriving there and uh, lasted only a couple of days in combat. And so I saw the other side, how it affected the people who were not in combat. Okay, uh, we've run over our time. <laughs> And I'm yeah. sure lots of people have lots more things to say. Hmm. I just might have one further comment about the um, friendships that resulted from the war. My father's best friend at Princeton was a man named Clarence Friedman. And I think he was from outside of Philadelphia, and I guess uh, he would go to that classmate's home and, uh, on occasion from Princeton while he was a student. In any event, Clarence Friedman told my father before the war, uh, uh, before he went off to action in the war, and he didn't. He was killed during the war. Well, my father didn't have him to see after the war, but he never ever failed to keep a relationship with Clara Friedman's mother. Hmm. Throughout, throughout the rest of her life, he kept in touch with Clara Friedman's mother. Hmm. Well, okay, I'll take I'll take Lester, and then uh, <laughs> and then we need to go. We, Run out of time and then some. I just wanted to go on record as being another uh, member of the group who went to Princeton and became a private right after. <laughs> <laughs> I was a private during <laughs>